Today our lesson is the transfiguration of Jesus. Uh, we're in uh, starting a new series for the uh, spring um, lesson book that we're using. Uh, the series is Worshiping Our Sovereign God. Uh, just understanding who God is, that he's worthy of our worship, uh, that he is the sovereign, the king of kings, and he's definitely worthy of our worship. Um, and so we're starting, uh, starting off with the transfiguration of Jesus. Um, the focus verse uh, is in the lesson text. Um, it's, a, it's a lot of reading to do both um, the Matthew section and the First Peter section. So I think I'm just going to do the, Matt, the scriptures out of Matthew 17, and then I'll just save um, what Peter has to say for probably further down in the lesson. Starting at Matthew 17, verse 1, it says, After six days... Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into an high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias, talking with him. Then answered Peter, and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee, and one for Moses, and one for Elias." While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were sore afraid. And Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise, be not afraid. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no man save Jesus only. And as they came down from the mountain, Jesus charged them, saying, Tell the vision to no man until the Son of Man be risen again from the dead. And his disciples asked him, saying, Why then say the scribes that Elias must first come? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Elias truly shall first come and restore all things. But I say unto you that Elias is come already, and they knew him not, but have done unto him whatsoever they listed. Likewise shall also the Son of Man suffer of them. Then the disciples understood that he spake unto them of John the Baptist. Uh, we'll stop there for the reading, say amen. Um, it, it, the topic here is the um, uh, is talking about the transfiguration here where he uh, changes appearance before them in a way that really just blows their mind and they get to see uh, what Peter says, um, uh, that he was an eyewitness of his majesty. And so these uh, three the disciples, the whole 12 weren't here. Jesus just takes three of them. And so the 12 is already like the inner circle group of his disciples. And then he takes like the inner circle of the inner circle. And he's got just Peter and John and James. Uh, and they get to see this. Um, it, the, the scripture here ends um, with their, you know, the mystery here of, well, they, you know, they think Elijah's coming. Elias here, just the same, just a different translation here of Elijah, that it's prophesied and people are expecting Elijah to come. And Jesus is saying, Elijah did come. And they did whatever they wanted to him, which they understood to mean, uh, he always talking about John the Baptist. John the Baptist, he did come. And he was the forerunner of the Messiah. Uh, that he came before uh, the Christ, announcing the Christ as the herald. Um, but... Uh, they understood that part that he was talking about John the Baptist and he said they did whatever they wanted which they know well they killed him they chopped off his head they know what that meant but then he said also the son of man shall suffer with them they didn't understand that part because uh, uh, even though they understood that John died they didn't understand yet even that Jesus was going to die and this uh, is packed in the scriptures with just this really repetitive he's constantly telling them you know, I'm going to suffer, I'm going to be dead three days, I'm going to rise again. And when you read, you know, the before scriptures, before this part and, and after this part, and you read in the different gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, there's just so much where he's constantly telling them, telling them he's going to die, and he's going to be resurrected, and they're not getting it. And uh, in, yeah, let's see, in one of the other gospels, this is one of those stories that um, you got to read all the accounts of it to kind of like piece it together. Um, there, you get different parts 
when you when you assemble everybody's perspective of it and you get you get m more of a full picture in a lot of things this is one of those things you get a more full picture when you do that in mark's account uh there there are some differences in the different accounts of this uh, this particular story uh for one it starts um after six days there jesus is saying some other stuff doing some other stuff in the previous scriptures and then it says after six days this is what happens and then uh, we're reading in the matthew account here is our text for today uh, mark also says he starts the story with after six days uh then the, then the, here's the transfiguration luke says about eight days later <laughs> and so the, you, when you see the, when you put the accounts of the, of the different uh, gospel writers together, you get things that sometimes it give you an opportunity to say, "Am I going to decide to believe this?" As an, am I, go, am I going to decide to believe an interpretation of this that makes it a contradiction, so that I can use it as an excuse to not believe, basically? Or you can assemble those things and say, "Well, I believe Jesus. I believe God." So I'm going to use the assembly of these things to interpret it for me. Um, and so we have these opportunities in the scriptures. This is one of those opportunities where people go, oh, well, this guy said six days, this guy said eight days. Clearly the Bible's false. See, <laughs> people do stuff like that. But they, they love to nitpick all these little things. But honestly, this is one of those, like, if you really read it, this is not even a contradiction. Six days versus about eight days. Does that even literally contradict? No. Uh, and then even if he didn't say about eight, even if he did say eight, that would let us know that uh, if we're believers, if we already know that Jesus died and rose again, and I'm filled with the Holy Ghost, and he, I've, he's leading me and helping me in my life, that I already know God, then those things would help me to realize that maybe the exact day doesn't matter. <laughs> it doesn't nullify the fact that I got the Holy Ghost, that God, that that Jesus was a real person, that there's more historical evidence for him than there is for George Washington. You know, there's, uh, it doesn't take all that away. It helps, it helps, helps me to understand what I'm supposed to be gaining from these things. Uh, but there are a couple things that we get in the other gospels. Um, Mark, I've heard, I believe, uh, and I didn't go back and track this down, but I, I think I've heard that Mark, some people think is, uh, actually Peter's account because we have, uh, we have Matthew uh, and John who were of the 12 disciples. And so when they're telling what Jesus did and what he said, it makes sense. They were there. But then you have Mark and Luke who weren't there. And so how do they know all this stuff? Some people think uh, that Luke uh, is writing what Paul has told him. Some people think, I believe, that Mark is writing uh, Peter's account, basically. And I, I don't know if that's true or not. I'm just saying that some people think that... Um, and you get little bits of maybe things that only Peter knew. Mark's account here, when he, when he says uh, uh, that Peter said, Lord, it's good for us to be here. When he sees this and, you know, his mind is blown. Like, Moses has been dead a while. Elijah's been dead a while. Or no, not Elijah's been dead, but he's been gone a while. And, and here's Jesus transformed into this glorious shining, like his face is shining like the sun, blowing his mind. And... Uh, in Mark's account, it, when it says, let's make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Elias, and one for uh, Moses. And then Mark says, for he knew not what to say. <laughs> and so it's like, you get that whole other other side of like, it's not like uh, that was like even the right thing to say, clearly. But you also see this vision of Peter. And he said this because he didn't know what to say. So... Uh, so he just speaks. Uh-oh, what do I say? I don't know. Just say something. <laughs> I didn't know what to say, so I said that. Uh, so you get that in Mark. Um, it, also in Mark's account, uh, you get the piece um, where in Matthew reading, they, they understood when he talked about John the Baptist, but they didn't understand when, when, they, when he talked about himself. Uh, in Mark's account, after it says that he explained to them that he's also going to, going to suffer at the hands of, uh, of the powers that be there, that he's going to die too. Uh, Mark lets us know, and they kept that saying with themselves, questioning one with another what the rising of the dead should mean. So it's not that they just went, you know, in one ear and out the other. He was repeatedly telling them, like, I'm going to die and rise again. So what we get out of Mark is 
that they heard it, but they just didn't understand it. And they're like, what do you think he means by that? He's going to die and rise again. Like, I, I don't know. I don't get it. Especially since they already know he's the Messiah. Like, he's going to die? What? Like, that, that doesn't make sense. And so uh, that it's just them trying to piece together their um, understanding. So when we put these things uh, together, we get a, we get a clear picture um, of, of, of what they're going through here. Um, a fuller vision uh, of the actual history of it. Um, and so one thing I want to really uh, bring out about the, the transfiguration of Jesus here, um, he, uh, he, he brings them up uh, to this, it's like, the, it, like I said, the inner circle. So this is a more intimate uh, group here. Not everybody gets this revelation, um, but he reveals himself and they get to see him transform his his clothes are white, his, uh, whiter than white, it says, whiter than anybody can actually bleach, bleach clothes, uh, and his face is shining like the sun. They see his glory. Um, but what we see, uh, I think, in that, in, in that they, in, in that even though we didn't see it, they got to see it. This is before he died and rose again. So uh, it's not that he somehow later was going to level up. Not that he was like a great prophet that somehow was later deified, later transformed into a super being, like some people that don't believe the Bible want to say uh, that, the, what, that that's what the Bible says. Uh, that's not what the Bible says. He's transfigured before he rose again. His, his glory and his majesty were seen uh, by these guys before he was resurrected. So who Jesus is, what Jesus is, uh, he's the same, the scripture says, today and yesterday uh, and forever. And so uh, this is who he always has been. He, he's, he's not later leveling up uh, to some kind of super being. He always is what he is. But then that's mysterious because if he's always God and, and he can show himself like that, why doesn't he? <laughs> You know, Johnny James said, well, Jesus, usually, Jesus walked on water, but he usually took the boat. That's a mystery. Uh, but we, ha we have to understand that if this is the God who hung the world on nothing, who created the fact that there is light, who created time and space and math and all the stuff that is inside of it, and us, and the fact that I love my kids and that their smile brings me joy, the God who created all these things has things figured out. Uh, the creator uh, says we're just by creation we see uh, his eternal power that he is so awesome he's got things figured out so if he is awesome and glorious and can shine with light before our faces but then he usually doesn't that means he's doing it intentionally this is on purpose so he's intentionally uh, uh, veiled um, and I thought of uh, the word forbearance. Um, the word forbearance came to mind. Romans two four. This is uses the I, uses the word forbearance not in the exact same way. Uh, it says, "Despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance." Uh, so he holds back. And so, in the context of that scripture, is he holds back because even though we're sinners and we deserve. Uh, or that we were sinners and that we did deserve uh, our death. He said the wages of sin is death. And so even though uh, it seems like it's taken him a while to uh, judge sometimes, that that's his mercy and that's his forbearance, that he's holding back, that he has a purpose. He's never late. He's never too busy. It's if, he, if he has forbearance, it's intentional. And so I think uh, the veiling of his identity by looking like a regular human being, by in fact being, that's the, that's the hard part, I think, uh, is just the incarnation, the mystery of the incarnation. That he was a man, that he was veiled in flesh, uh, so that he's doing that in his forbearance, in his withholding. I looked up the word for forbearance. One of the definitions was to withhold, and one of the definitions was to avoid voluntarily. So... The transfiguration proves that he is voluntarily avoiding appearing like that. 
voluntarily avoiding revealing himself in that way for that time, though he's perfectly capable. Um, it's his forbearance. Um, before, uh, before Danielle was my girlfriend, when I first started uh, interacting with Danielle, when I first started to know her, um, I uh, purposely never complimented her, and I never bought her anything, despite my desire to do that. Uh, and, you know, I had, uh, I had, I didn't have girlfriends and stuff, you know, as a kid and growing up, and so I saw other people interacting with girls, and so when I had a girl that I wanted to interact with, I had a lot of, you know, I had seen other, seen other ways to do it, and I had friends that, you know, they would say the sweet stuff, even uh, Bishop Burrell on Tuesday was talking about how sweet he would talk uh, to a girl, or how, you know, how sweet men might talk to a girl, but then, you know, they're ready to maybe sweet talk the next girl, too, so you got to watch out, uh, but that was true of my friends, that I'd seen, you know, I'd seen them interact with girls, and they were ready to sweet talk the next girl just as much as they did the previous girl because they just wanted to, like, you know, trick her into think getting whatever she wanted uh, for the time being. I even had one friend. He would just get credit cards and rack up credit cards and <laughs> buy girl stuff. He bought one girl a bunch of diamonds, you know, never intending to pay for those diamonds, but, <laughs> like, just trying to give her what she wanted. And so I had seen stuff like that, and so I didn't want to do that. I didn't want Danielle to just, like, getting stuff from me. I, that's, not the, that's not the way that I wanted to get her attention. Um, and I would even see, like, like, you know, Danielle used to spend hours primping and getting ready in girly ways to, you know, be seen in public and stuff. And, you know, she'd do her hair in fancy ways or whatever, and other people would compliment her in my presence. And it would just, there was one time that made me so mad, I still remember it. <laughs> and because I'm here, because I was withholding. I was forbearing. Like, that's what I was trying not to do. Because I didn't want to just be the sweet talker that says, oh, you're so beautiful, and I don't know how you do that with your hair, but it just flows like, you know, heavenly rays of sunshine or something. I don't, like, I didn't want to sweet talk her and just, like, bait her into my presence uh, with sweet talk. I was forbearing. I was withholding. Even when it was very hard for me to do that. Um, but I maintained forbearance so I could get what I wanted. That's why I was forbearing. What I wanted is for her to uh, like me back, for her to not just like the diamonds I was going to buy her. <laughs> like, not that I, I was going to do that anyway. But uh, so I, I didn't want her to just like that. You know, I take I took her to fancy restaurants because then what if she just likes going to fancy restaurants? What if she just likes to get you know get nice things? Uh, if I was going to buy her diamonds, I could do that once, and then I would spend the rest of my life trying to pay off that credit card or something, you know? Like, uh, there would be another guy who could buy her bigger diamonds if that's what she wanted. Uh, so I was forbearing, I was withholding, so that I could get what I wanted, which is her to actually like me, uh, not her to like the stuff that I give. I intentionally uh, was forbearing, intentionally uh, withholding. And the Bible says, without faith, it is impossible to please him. Jesus is looking for faith. Uh, if he wanted to walk around glowing and, you know, light beaming from him or a hundred feet tall and the world melts and leaves red hot glowing footprints everywhere he goes, if he wanted to do that, he could, right? I mean, he could do, he could do whatever he wants. Like everything is because he made it that way. He could just make it different. He breaks the laws when he wants to just to prove who he is. He walks on water if he wants to. Uh, he, make, you know, he makes one boy's lunch feed 10,000 people if he wants to. He does whatever he wants, whenever he wants. But that makes it clear that he doesn't just want to do that all the time. He's forbearing, he's withholding. Um, uh, the Bible says uh, you know, that the mountains melt at his voice. Uh, that the trees shatter at his voice, that deers give birth at the sound of his voice. <laughs> like, he could just talk like that at all, all the time. Uh, there's one really mysterious scripture that always boggles my mind. When they came to get him, to arrest him before they crucified him, they asked, uh, they were looking for Jesus, and he said, I am. Uh, and it says, and they went backwards, which I feel so robbed by that translation. What does that mean? Were they scared and took a step back? Or does that mean 
Literally the power of him saying, I am, knocked them off their feet. I kind of think that. Because this is the God that Moses saw where the mountain was on fire. And the, you know, the mountain, is there's like an earthquake. And when he spoke to Israel from the mountain, they said, um, No, Moses, how about you just talk to him? That was scary. Uh, and so I think he probably knocked them down just by saying, I am. And clearly, that's still withholding. Because if his voice is that powerful, that means he could have just incinerated them all the wicked sinners that they were, by the sound of his voice. But he just let a little bit of his power just eke through, just to uh, get a little glimpse. So he withholds uh, so that he can get what he wants. You know, God can always give the best gifts. And we always come to God and we want gifts. And that's what he was constantly preaching to people and telling them, you know, you're following me because you ate the miraculous food that I multiplied. You should have seen that as a sign of who I was. That's what he was trying to tell them. And they were constantly missing it, which you can understand. If you're blind, you want to see. He's, you know, he's like, your sins are forgiven you. Next, what do you want? I want to see. We can't blame a blind man for wanting to see. But how about the sins thing, too? <laughs> you know, as much as it is, as much as you want, your, uh, you want to be able to see if you're blind, he's also here giving the forgiveness of sins. Yeah, you're not going to get your eyes to see anywhere else, but you're also definitely not going to get forgiveness of sins anywhere else. That's what we have, that's what he's wanting to understand, that he's the one who can do that. Um, He can give the best gifts. He, you know, and if he's just looking to woo us into love with him by showering us with stuff, he can give us all the money. He can give us a credit card that has an infinity limit. Uh, you know, he can sing the best, sweetest songs to us if he wanted to do that. You know, obviously, you know, God could give the best back rubs and smooches if that's what he was. If he was, that's what he was trying to bait us into his presence with. Um, uh, he's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or think, even. He could blow our minds with the things that I can't even imagine that he could do for us. But he doesn't do that. He withholds. He forbears. Uh, because if, uh, if he did do those things, how would I know if I love him or if I love the stuff that he's giving? That's what, that's what I, it was about with me and Danielle. I don't know why I was that smart when I was 20 years old or 19 years old. Uh, but I, I, I wanted to know that she loved me, not just the stuff I'm giving. And so clearly God knows that about us. He knows whether we love him or the stuff that he gives, uh, but do we know? (laughs) That's the trick. Do I know if I love God or the stuff that he gives? Uh, He's going to prove, he's going to bear our hearts out. And there's a scripture uh, in Psalm 51 when David, uh, his psalm of repentance, uh, when he repents after he, um, does the whole thing with Bathsheba and her, kills her husband and, uh, and he comes to repentance and he says against thee thee only have I sinned he says God my sin is against you and he says that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest uh, and clear when thou judgest at the throne of judgment whatever judgment God makes he will be clear because he is going to spend our lives revealing our hearts And so we're going to bring our life, our history to God. And if we, you know, I think before I was saved, I I just thought, well, I hate God and he probably hates me. Well, that was wrong. But if I had died and come before the throne like that, like, well, I hate you and I think you probably hate me, right? That's not the way you want to, like, come before God. Uh, Thank God for his mercy. He gives us time and he works in our lives uh, in ways that gives us an opportunity to change. Uh, but it says he will be clear when he judges. And so you think, why does God allow, I mean, there's some really bad, bad stuff in the world. How does he allow that? Well, when he judges, he will be clear. Because if they repent, if they, he, first of all, they have time to repent. Second of all, if, they, if we spend our whole lives not repenting, then those really bad things that people have done, God will be clear when he judges them. He will be without blame. When he sends people, anybody he sends to hell, 
will clearly not deserve to be in his presence. Uh, and uh, the sad thing is, uh, so many people are deceived into thinking they don't want to be in his presence. But that's what we really need, is to be with him, to be able to be in it. To, that's the deception that the devil has, is we don't want to be in his presence. But he's the one who is the rich guy with all the money and all the best compliments and all the best songs and all the sweetest, anything you could ever want, he's got it. If we'll love him back, all those things come with it. But those things are the side things to loving him. He wants us to love him. And so he has, so he has uh, had this forbearance. Um, the truth about flattery and gifts and attention and money and whatever you could want um, is if you love those things, you know, we can... You can, you can get caught up loving the things and think, oh, well, I, I don't. Uh, and you can, it's easier to see in other people. I don't think they even love that person. I think they just love his, you know, Mercedes, or they love his big house, or they love his credit card, or they love, you know, that he's the best-looking dude around and they like being seen with him or whatever. Um, you can see that on other people, and you can think, well, they love all those other things. But really, when we love other things and we just want the things from somebody, what it is, is the what we love might be that, but then it's not that we love a thing instead of a who. It means that the who we love is ourselves. Because if I love money and candy and back rubs or whatever, then what I love, then that's what I love because who I love is me. And so uh, that that is a revealing. Jesus is smart enough to make uh, make the distinction between these things. He's smart enough to make the distinction between do we love him, do we love stuff, do we love ourselves? He, and he is, he's, he's using our lives and using the revelation of himself to divide, to make that uh, distinction. And one of the ways he proves it out is by his forbearance. Lily, when she was, I think, three years old, she's riding the back of the van, and all of a sudden she says, Whoa, oh, oh. I asked God if I could see fireworks, and he, I don't see them. And she had such a pure little heart and so much faith that somehow at three years old, she thought, well, you know, I could just really see some fireworks right now. <laughs> so, she, so she prayed for them. And she was like, God, can I see some fireworks? I mean, I assume this is what's going on in her mind. She just told us the aftermath. And she was kind of upset that Jesus didn't do what she wanted when she wanted it. Fireworks did not just start exploding all around. Uh, but clearly he can do that, but he's forbearing. Uh, that he's not just the servant that just does whatever you want. He's the Lord that loves us and wants to give us good things. Uh, but he's forbearing, and if we'll understand how awesome and smart and wise and omniscient he is, even in... It, which the Bible says the world declares how awesome he is in that way, that he's got things figured out. He's, if he's got things so figured out, then he's got a reason for everything he does. And so if he doesn't show me the fireworks just because I asked to see fireworks, he has a reason. So there's faith. I can believe, well, God, if you don't give me the fireworks right now, there's a reason. Jesus came to a guy who was lame. I can't remember if he was lame from birth or blind from birth. And the disciple said, well, did this guy sin to deserve this? Did his parents sin to deserve this? And Jesus blew everybody's mind, including ours. And he said, this man like this for the glory of God. Wait, what? He's been miserable for the past 40 years and crippled for 40 years for the glory of God? What in the world? So we have to have that faith in Jesus that he's got it figured out. It might not make sense to us. And it might seem like he's withholding too much, but he has a, you, you know, what that ought to do is it ought to, it ought to increase our measure of how awesome we think he is. Because how does that make sense? If he's this, if, if the guy, if it's a good thing for that guy to be lame or blind or whatever, if that's a good thing, if that's a good thing in the plan of God, that this is for the glory of God, that somehow his healing is not only going to be, uh, the help that he needs to live the rest of his life, but it's going to make all the previous time worth it? By that statement, like God is like 
he's, 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 he's affirming that all of the bad things, according to him, are worth what happens in the end. What? That blows my mind because I find out more and more how evil the world is. There are things, like, I think I have a really awesome imagination. Maybe that's pride, I don't know. But I can think of some stuff that I feel like other people can't think of sometimes. When I was, like, a little kid, I thought, well, what if you, what if you, you know, you swing a rope around or whatever and it flings out. I thought, what if you thought, let a rope out so high to the sky that the spinning of the earth would just hold the rope up? Like, I feel like I had that imagination as a kid. I feel like I have a good imagination. But the evil that people think of nowadays, when I hear of things sometimes, I'm like, what? That is such a tragedy. I, can, I couldn't even have fathomed evil like that. What that does for me is it measures. It measures God bigger. It's not like I just have to eat Brussels sprouts and suffer the Brussels sprouts until I get to heaven and I get cake. That would be a small measure of his goodness. Like if it was all just, you know, I have to, you know, eat my vegetables now, but when we get to heaven, oh boy, it's going to be good. Well, so what, cake? That's a small measure. The Brussels sprouts on earth of evil are so bad that for Jesus to say this is worth it, all of the evil that has happened in the entirety of history, for Jesus to say, don't worry, I got this. That is amazing. That means he is mind-blowingly good. That means somehow, he, that means he is worthy to be bowed down with my face on the ground. And that means I'm not worthy to be in his presence because I'm part of the problem down here, right? And so it, for, him to, for him to affirm uh, that though he forbears, though he is withholding, he can come down in bright, shining glory and fix everything in a second. That he can do those things. So uh, that measures his goodness bigger than I can imagine. And the more I find out about evil in the world, the bigger that measures God until I can finally just realize God cannot be measured. How good is God? The, the, the question is posed in the Bible. The answer is not really given. <laughs> oh, how great is his goodness. There's, you can't answer that. You can't measure it. You can't tell how great it is. So that's, uh, we do that in math and algebra and stuff, you know, or you know, pi. You just write pi. There's a symbol for pi because you can't write it all out. So you just refer to it. So sometimes in math, you can refer to things with the problem, not with the solution, because the solution is too big to handle. That's what that scripture is. Oh, how great is his goodness. It's just posing the question as the answer because the answer is too big, too big for us. Um, so part of the way God make, makes that distinction is through his forbearance. Um, the voice comes down from heaven. Peter talked about this, uh, P Peter later on in the epistle of Peter that was in our lesson that we didn't read. Um, let me scroll back up to it. He says, we have made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, oh, we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made it known unto you, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Which is just is, which is his witness. He's saying this is not like a made up religion thing. Like we saw him. He he told them not to say this till he was resurrected. Peter later wrote this after he was resurrected. So now he's free now God's given him the freedom to say this. But he says, We were eyewitnesses of his majesty. He received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Uh, you know, nowadays, if a booming voice came, like, I might, depending on what it says or how I feel like you know, God's leading me to understand it, uh, I'm, I've seen so much technology stuff nowadays, like holograms, you know, you know uh, throwing noise, speaker noise at you. If I heard a booming voice, like, saying something to me right now, like, if it was like, vote for Trump, I would just think, wow. They must have satellites that can do that to your brain now or something. I don't know. Uh, but in Peter's day, he didn't, ha he, he didn't have any of that hang-up of like, oh, I wonder what technology they're using to deceive me right now. He just heard the booming voice uh, from heaven, and he knew it was God. 
Uh, this is God confirming what's going on here. And he was forever changed by it. He heard the voice of God. He believed the voice of God. Uh, and so, uh, and that actually confirmed, that happened after, uh, I can't remember if it was the Matthew or the Mark, maybe both of them. Um, but it was after Jesus asked Peter, who do you say that I am? It was after Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son of God, after he had confessed that to Jesus, after he was a believer of that, then he got the revelation from heaven, this is my beloved son. So he, had, he heard from heaven after he believed and after he had already confessed to Jesus, I know you're it. Then he got to hear, he got an awesome confirmation of that. Um, There's a couple times uh, where that voice from heaven happens. Uh, it happened at his baptism. And then also Jesus, as he's praying in front of people in John 12, uh, he says, Father, glorify thy name. And it says, There came a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. The people thereof that stood by and heard it said that it thundered. Others said an angel spoke to him. Uh, and that I, that I think that happens in other times where people say it thundered. I think uh, when... Paul was Saul on the road to Damascus, and, uh, and, and God speaks to him out of heaven and says, I am Jesus. Uh, and I think, it, I think in that uh, part, too, it says it sounded like thunder to some people. And so uh, that also uh, makes me wonder, okay, does that mean that the words aren't heard by everybody? Uh, that you have to be on a heart and a place where God, though you may see and hear some awesome stuff and not understand it, that it can, there's levels of forbearance, right? And so, which we do in our lives, uh, we have levels of forbearance, you know. I, uh, clothing is a good one. We're more or less dressed depending on <laughs> who we're around, right? Uh, because there's a level of intimacy where, uh, uh, you know, I get all the way undressed with the very one, with the most intimate, right? But, um, and so there's uh, m more revealing with the more uh, higher level of intimacy. I'm tr struggling to put that into words, but I think you probably know what I mean. Um, but so some said it thundered. Others thought it was an angel speaking. So others at least understood that there was speech going on. Um, but the voice said, uh, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. And so uh, it says, Jesus answered and said, This voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. Jesus doesn't need to hear from heaven. <laughs> it's him. Some people struggle with that because, you know, they go, Well, how is he here and there? Je at the same time. First of all, uh, he's God, he does whatever he wants. Second of all, uh, he says, It's for our sakes. What, every, all, all the revelation of Jesus uh, on earth uh, is for our sakes. Uh, and he's om, omnipresent, right, also? When we think of the uh, day of Pentecost, and you've probably seen uh, any artistic version of what the Holy Ghost looked like on everybody, it said it sat on each of them. It, the Holy Ghost, the one spirit, right, sat on each of them. Anybody who ever drew that drew multiples at the same time, Man multiple manifestations at the, right, at the same time. Nobody has a problem with that. Jesus told Nicodemus, uh, he said, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. He was talking about himself. So you're in heaven, but you're right here in front of me. Yeah, that's what he said. And so even though he's manifested here and now, he manifests himself however, whenever, so that he can uh, do it for our sakes. He's revealing himself to us. He says, this voice came not for me, but for your sakes. Um, that we, we need to hear from heaven. Uh, his appearance, I'm going to kind of skip through this. Uh, but there is a, there's a couple other times in the scripture where we get the same vision. 
of the Almighty God. It was interesting when I thought, okay, when is his appearance? And I thought, because we recently were in Isaiah 6, and I went there, it doesn't describe him at all, which was surprising. I realized, oh, the only thing it says in Isaiah 6 is that his train filled the temple, and it describes what the angels actually look like. But in Revelation, John gets to see him, uh, and it talks about the Son of Man with this... uh, with the seven golden candlesticks around him, and he has the seven stars in his hand, uh, and his head and his hairs were like white, were white like wool and white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet undefined brass, uh, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. Uh, I'm sure these are just things that are men trying to put things into words, like how do you describe this? And I think uh, we um, are too uh, cult, uh, how am I trying to say this? I think we're desensitized by our culture of uh, movies and video games and cartoons and special effects. We're used to watching gods on the TV, right? And now, like, uh, the computer effects especially have gotten to where, you know, they, they're glowing and they're flying and they're, voice can boom or whatever uh but in reality the guys who were not used to watching avengers movies and stuff like that superman they always had a uh a a awesome respect for beings that glow and fly and (laughs) and their voice booms uh and so i think that's uh something we need to keep in check like god is real And angels are real. And if somebody's really glowing and flying and stuff and their voice shakes the earth, you don't just, like, walk up and bump fists and say, hey, buddy, (laughs) like, it's time to, like, recognize that we're created lower and that, uh, well, Isaiah said he saw himself, right, when he was in the presence of God and the angels. He saw himself. And so there's a proper response. We want to have the proper response. I don't think i need to probably i don't know warn anybody in case they have an angelic appearance but we all do need to come before god in prayer in faith for salvation we all do have to come before god and we have to understand that um he's high he's the most high he's high and lifted up we have to come with a certain amount of humility certain amount of respect for who he is uh maybe you'll go bump fists with donald trump or somebody like that but you don't just like walk up to, you know, any other country leader. <laughs> Historically, kings have respect. Uh, I watched a, a video on, it was just like a little short video about the, I can't remember if I was looking at the British soldiers, you know, those guys where they, that aren't supposed to move and stuff, and I was looking about the soldiers, and um, I think it was because I was looking about repentance, and they say that those guys shout out, repent, and they turn around like part, as part of their march, and um, Uh, When they shout repent, that means, like, do a 180 and march the other direction. So I was looking stuff up like that about the British soldiers, and I found one video of, uh, they're like, make way for the queen, and the gate opens, and, you know, the carriage comes out, and some lady did not get out of the way, and she did not make way for the queen. And that, you know, the dude with the big funny hat, and they're marching, and he just, like, knocked her. She went flying. And they just kept on marching. Like, when you have royalty, <laughs> like, there's a certain level of respect here. You don't just do whatever you want. Like, the, that was for the Queen of England. So, Jesus demands all our respect just because of who he is, the king of the universe. How much more because of the love that he's proven for us? Won't we have the utmost respect for him? Um, Uh, But he reveals a little bit uh, of his identity here. Uh, His closer disciples got a greater revelation of his identity. Don't I want to be a closer disciple? Don't I want to get closer to God? Uh, There's more revelation of his identity when we get closer to him. Ultimately, we will see him, uh, and we will be with him, but we want to be have that closeness and have that revelation not be the 
peasant who won't get out of the way and gets knocked down by the guards, right? Uh, wisdom and uh, knowledge shall be the stability of thy times and strength of salvation. These guys got a little bit of extra knowledge about God. And it says uh, in that same scripture, the fear of the Lord is his treasure. Uh, there's a biblical fear that's not the same as, uh, oh, no, I'm scared, get out of here kind of fear. There's a twinge of that to the fear of God. Because, like I said, because he's high and lifted up, because of who he is, because he's the king of kings, the master of the universe. In fact, the Bible says uh, the Lord is high above the heavens, uh, and he humbleth himself to behold the things that are in heaven and in earth. When I saw that, I was like, wait, what? You know, you, you have this vision of God in heaven looking down on earth. That's not what it says. It says he humbles himself to look down on heaven. Not just looking down on heaven, humbling himself to look down on heaven. There's a language here that he is the most high. He is high above all. Much as he holds the earth in his hand, he holds heaven in his hand too. And all the angels. You know those guys that have been alive for thousands of years without disobeying God? And when he shows up, they cover their face even though they're there glowing and flying? That's the high and lifted up God. The fear of the Lord is his treasure. I need to get a little bit of glimpse. I need to get more revelation of who he is. I have to come and find out about uh, uh, his identity, about his majesty, about his glory, so I can get a little glimpse of, like, is he really all that? <laughs> because he is. And he has good plans. He has it figured out. And though he forbears if, uh, and says, without faith, it is impossible to please him. If I will just step in faith, if I will believe him, if I will say, I see your love, and I want to I wanna know you more, then I can have that uh, deeper revelation. I can come to him in the proper fear. The, uh, I didn't finish up with uh, talking about fear. There's a scripture that says, There is forgiveness with thee that thou mayest be feared. That helps, I think, define the biblical fear for us. I think I, I always want to pull that one in. There is forgiveness with thee that thou mayest be feared. Because when we think of how high God is and how awesome God is and how holy and perfect he is and how loving uh, and patient he is with us all, uh, and then for him to be forgiving to us. I keep saying, and I've said a lot, and I think I said it recently, but like how I used to do bad things before I was saved that when those same things were done to me, I thought those person, those people should be scrubbed off the face of the earth. That's how I thought about me from the outside, because I did those things. And so I had already judged myself worthy of death, let alone how does, you know, how does the holy, perfect God think about me, especially compared to you know, everybody else. But there is forgiveness with thee that thou mayest be feared. So that kind of fear that I have for God, while I tremble in his presence, bow before his presence because of his greatness, it's also... Uh, like what? Like just the awesome reverence we have for the God who will forgive. Forgiveness with thee that thou mayest be feared. How much respect. that uh, The fear of God has a major flavor of respect. How much respect, how much awe, how much reverence will I have for that awesome God who also forgives. And that fear uh, is his treasure. Uh, that we hold him in, the prop, in his proper place. Isn't that what we want out of people who love us? It's not that we want to be their God and we want to be, I don't want to be worshipped by Danielle. I don't want to be worshipped by my kids. I don't want them to think, them, think of them more than I am. But I do want them to hold me in their hearts and minds in the proper place. And I want, uh, I want my children to have a proper respect for me. But know that they can approach me and that I love them, Right? To, hold, to be held in the proper place. To not, and I don't want to be despised by them or trampled by them. I want to have a level of respect, but a proper level of respect and a relationship of love. To be held in the proper place in their hearts and minds. Same thing with my wife. I don't need her, her to worship me or anything else. I just need her to hold me in the proper place. That we're going to love and cherish and have and hold, and I'm going to do her good on purpose. Uh, like I promised, the rest of her life. And that she holds me in the proper place and has the proper place of respect for me. So for, that's what God wants too. But except we can't overestimate. <laughs> we have to know that the highest we can think still does not yet attain. So just go for that. Let's just hold him in the, high, the highest place in our hearts and have that fear. That fear of the Lord is 
uh, his treasure. Um, and then when we get that glimpse of him, uh, when we get that revelation uh, more and more of his identity, uh, we, um, Michelle always sings a song, Oh, I Want to See Him. These guys got to see him. Uh, these guys got to see him a little bit before the time of seeing him. Oh, I want to see him can be the cry of my heart. That the, At the transfiguration of Jesus, he cracked a little glimpse before the time of really showing everybody uh, so that he can let us know he is something to be seen. But he only did that for those three guys. That was a special, like they didn't, he, he even told them, don't even say this until after I, after I am died, died and resurrected. So he had, a, he had a specific glimpse for these guys for, for a specific time uh, that is closed off to the rest of the world. But Jesus is not closed off to the rest of the world in every way. He has much forbearance. But what he has not forbo- forborn, I guess, I don't know the past tense, but the, what he doesn't hold back is uh, his, his love on the cross. The whole world is hearing. He's declaring to the world his love by his sacrifice that he died for our sins. This is declared to the world. This is the part he wants to show. This is the part that, you know, like I, like, for me to try to want Danielle to like this part of me instead of the rich part of me, God, yes, can heal you and make you wealthy and healthy and live long and all the stuff you want. He can do that, but he's not revealing himself as just the one who just goes around and doing that for everybody. What he has revealed himself to everyone is the cross and that I love you this much, that I'm not just up here away from you uh, mad at you because you're filthy, that he loves us enough to step down to come down to heaven, down to earth, down to being to, to in our hands in our wicked rage against him as we torture him and kill him because we don't like him because he's good and he's saying that we're not. And he's... And, and to pay the price for our sin. To say, you know what? You're the one that deserves to die. You're the one killing. You're the one that's wicked. You're the one shaking your fist at me. Here. Here's the gun. You shoot me. And by that, you will see that I love you. At the same time, I'm going to pay the price. I'm going to pay the debt for your sin so that you can be clean when you're dead, standing before God. That he has proven his love on the cross and his sacrifice for our sins. That is the part he has revealed of himself. That is the part he does not forbear. That is the part that he is showing and that he has a plan. That yes, all the glowing and power and majesty is him, clearly. But he's holding that back for those who will see the cross, who those who will see his love, those who will see his sacrifice, that I love you this much and want to be with him. Not just want streets of gold, <laughs> not just want a mansion on a hilltop, not just want to not hurt anymore. I've always heard old people talk about that, and I'm 40 now, and I'm starting to understand a little bit. And uh, not just want those things, because if I love things, then who do I love? Me. But will I love him back? He's looking for people who will respond to him, respond to his love, who will love him back. And those who will love him will be adopted, will be married, will be his forever and with him. And that's what he's looking for, somebody who will be gladly with him. Because, you know, heaven is not for me. <laughs> Heaven's not for any of us. Uh, the Lord's Prayer uh, says, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That means heaven is not where my will is done. Heaven is where God's will is done. It's his heaven for him. And so what he wants in heaven is people who are happy to be there, <laughs> happy to be with him. People who believe that he has a plan, people who believe he's got it, he's got this, he's got it figured out, and it's good and he is well able to make it worth it to me, whatever it is. It was worth it to him, 
He came and he, he proved his love. He said, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the shame of the cross. Uh, so the joy that he knows in heaven with the people who will love him back is worth everything else. That is such an awesome joy to God where he gets what he wants. People who are happy to be with him, uh, people who will just love him back. And I, he's the one who loved first. We just love back. All we have to do is just love him back. Uh, oh, I want to see him. I want to see this awesome God. Uh, and uh, I will gladly worship this great God. The series here that we're uh, entering into is worshiping our sovereign God. This is a God worth worshiping. This is, uh, he is the most high. Not only is he worthy of my worship, not only am I by him and for him, not only is everything the Bible says created by him, for him, for his pleasure, on the one hand he owns everything, including me, because he made us. How much more worthy on top of that is he because of his love, because of his sacrifice, because of the way he proved, this is how I feel about you. This is how, feeling's not the right word. We get caught up, like, with love as a feeling, like you can't control it or something. He's, the Bible says he set his love upon us. Uh, it's a, he, that he decides, like, just like you decide to love somebody, uh, and that's why we, that's why we vow at our wedding, uh, because we're, we have to have the decision power. It's like, I'm deciding to love you, despite how I might feel in the future, because I know my feelings are transient. I'm, dis- I'm, I'm setting my love on you on purpose. He set his love on us. Will we set his love, uh, will we set our love back on him? He's worthy because he's God, because he's the creator, because, he's, because of his majesty, how much more is he worthy of my love because of, because of his love for me and what he's done for me on the cross? Amen? Uh, so I will, I, will, uh, I will love him back, and I will worship this sovereign God, this in-control God. I will trust his forbearance and have faith in him and love him back. Amen?